G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Today we are doing another edition of AFL Unpopular Opinions. In this series, I get you guys to write in the community tab some of your AFL Unpopular Opinions. So we've got heaps, I think we have like 53 comments on this particular episode, which is great. So we are going to crack straight in. A little bit of a disclaimer, I'm recording this on April 2nd, which means this is about eight days before you're actually going to watch it. And it's actually going to be about two weeks after a lot of these comments. That being said, I thought about this. Is it unfair to put comments made two weeks ago public and, and assess them after the fact when we've had so much more information since then? But then I realized if you got an unpopular opinion, same thing with me. If you believed it eight days ago, it shouldn't have been proven wrong already. So we're all under the microscope here and I actually think it, it makes it a little bit more interesting. So we're gonna crack straight in. And we got a bunch related to Caleb Sarong to start off, which is uh, interesting. We got four comments here. Two people, Chomix and Graz Best Clips both say Sarong wins the brown low. Sasquatch Frio, member of the channel, says Andy Brayshaw's best is better than Caleb Sarong's best. And then we have Fidget Frio Man saying either Caleb Sarong or Errol Golden will win two Brownlow medals by 2030. So let's unpack these. Sarong for Brownlow, I actually really like this call. I, I actually think he could be a serious dark horse. We're only three rounds in, but absolutely I think he could win it. Further to that, to Fidget Frio Man, who says Sarong or Golden could win two Brownlow medals, I actually think that's true too. I've actually privately thought that previously. I think Caleb Sarong, maybe it's just because he reminds me of Lockie Neal. I don't know if it's some sort of psychological element there, but I do think he's the sort of guy who could just be consistently in the mix for a Brown low and therefore win two. You know, if you win two, you're in the Fife and Goods category. Again, like I'm not huge on the Brownlow medal as an actual indicator of how good a player is. And therefore saying, I'll be surprised if Caleb Sarong ends up as good as Fife or Goods in the same way that I don't think Neil is at that level. But, but Caleb Sarong is an unreal player, could easily win the Brownlow. It's amazing how young he is. And sorry, I haven't even talked about Goulding yet, but he's in that same category of quality. If he got close in something like his third season, like he was very close to winning the Brownlow last year, you think by 2030, but six more seasons, yeah, Goulding is another contender who could win too. And there's some nuance to this, because I think Bontempelli is currently a better player than both, um, but I'll be happy if he just wins one at this rate. It's crazy that he hasn't won one. As for Brayshaw's best being better than Sarong's, I actually had a look, Joycey, uh, and to, to had a look at some of these stats. So I'm comparing Caleb Sarong's start to this year versus Brayshaw's 2022 season, which I think was his career best season. So they're just stats and they're only in the first three rounds, but Sarong averages seven more disposals. Six of those seven disposals are effective disposals. All seven of those extra disposals are contested possessions. 501 meters gained versus just Brayshaw's 369 that year. He's averaging three more clearances. Tackles are about the same. And where Brayshaw edged him is on inside 50s and one percenters. Now I do realize that this is completely limited by the fact that Sarong's played three games, three matters, one or three games. And the opposition, you know, whatever you think of them aren't playing well. So you'd imagine that average comes down a little bit. But I, on balance, I, th I think Sarong's best is better. He's also the same age now as Brayshaw was in 2022. So it is comparing apples with apples. We'll move on to the next point here, um, which is a general point from Tome. There isn't enough parity in the league. Too many sides are stuck in the middle and teams like Geelong, Collingwood, with Sydney, GWS and Port Adelaide dominate for far too long without any real challenges. Occasionally you get a team who get out of the muck, but not too many teams are caught in the middle. The league needs a full reset of contenders sooner. It's going to get stale. I, I'm not too sure if I fully agree with this. One interesting thing is that if you look at the, well, uh, the bottom four currently and my predicted bottom four, and you look at the 2015 ladder, the reason this comes to mind is I recently did a video on the 2015 season for, for West Coast, but who are the bottom three teams right now? It's West West Coast, North Melbourne, and Hawthorne. West Coast and Hawthorne was a 2015 grand final. North Melbourne made a prelim that year. Richmond was a team I personally had in my bottom four. I don't think they're going to be a bottom four team from what I've seen so far this year, but obviously they finished fifth that year and then went on to have uh, three out of the next four flags. Adelaide was a great team around that period. They're possibly down towards the bottom four. My point being here is we are seeing a cycle. We are seeing a cycle. I do feel like Port Adelaide's jumped up and down, to be honest, as well. In the last 10 years as well, we've seen three relatively unsuccessful teams bob up and win premierships. So the Bulldogs did it in 2016. That was their second ever premiership. Melbourne broke a 50-year streak as well after being a bit of a joke in 2010 onwards. Richmond also had a horrific 30-year run to then go, go win three out of four premierships. So I actually think the evenness of the comp is, is pretty good, at least from a cyclical point of view. There are a few exceptions. Geelong, Collingwood, and Sydney in particular, they tend to be successful for large periods of time. It doesn't make sound good making this point, but West Coast generally has been up there too. Hawthorne as well, obviously have fallen away in the last five or so years. But you do get those perennially competitive teams, and I think that is just always going to happen, and I think they're worthy of praise. And you do have teams that tend to get stuck and struggle for, for larger periods of time. But other than that, I actually think the cyclical nature of it is about right. I think it's in pretty good shape. 
This video is brought to you proudly in a paid partnership with BetterHelp, which is a platform that matches you with a credentialed therapist who is trained to listen and give helpful, unbiased advice. Now, the idea of starting therapy may be a little bit daunting. There are some people who may be a little bit uncomfortable with the face-to-face -face interaction. And in some cases as well, you might not feel like you're gonna be matched with the right therapist for you because they might not live in your area. But that's the great thing about BetterHelp because you can set up your therapy sessions either through phone call, video chat, or if you prefer text messaging, whatever's the most comfortable for you, it's super convenient. To get started in the process, all you have to do is click either the link in the description or you go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. It takes you to a questionnaire and you fill that out so that they can assess your specific needs. In most cases, they will then match you with a therapist within 48 hours. You can then book your therapy sessions at a time that is convenient for you. And if you find that you're matched with someone that isn't quite the right fit, you do have the ability to switch to a different one at no additional cost. So if you think BetterHelp might be the right fit for you, like I said, you go to the link in the description or you can go to BetterHelp help.com forward slash true footy. Now clicking that link does support the channel, but also gets you 10% off your first month with better help. So you can be matched with a therapist who can listen and help. Ollie B says, we have cameras. Why are bad umpiring decisions not overturned? Uh, so from a practical point of view, I presume you mean like if there's a missed hole in the ball or a high tackle in the middle of the ground, why is it not overturned? So first of all, you need to wait to a stoppage because you can't just review every single decision and go back. It would just practically be really tough. And if you only did it for some situations and not others, it would start to get quite unfair. I think the goal reviews are disruptive enough without broadening it to other umpiring decisions, which is what I presume you meant. Mike 01 says the AFL isn't corrupt. That's his unpopular opinion. I do agree. It depends what you mean by corrupt. I think there's there's always going to be a level of um, deviousness. I, I do think the AFL does have its motives and agendas a little bit, and they will push towards that. This equalization measure, I, I'm not against equalization by any stretch, but you do see them making different decisions for sometimes rather than others, and it's a really unfair league, and what they're trying to do is make the league even to maximize money. So I do agree that they got ulterior motives sometimes, but I don't think necessarily anyone's pulling the strings to really dictate results, in my opinion. Bazza 98 has an interesting one. He says that low tackle should be allowed. That's interesting. Depends how low you mean. Like if it's just below the waist, but above the knee. It actually took me a second to really think why it's not allowed. A high tackle is a bit more obvious in why it's not allowed. I'd say a low tackle still uh, is still likely to cause injury because you think about it, your players are more likely to just fall forward. I mean, I suppose that's true of any tackle, but I feel like, you know, if you get legged, your feet really go from under you. So I, I do feel like maybe there's a slightly higher chance of injury that way. Play on footy says Adam Simpson is the right man for the Eagles rebuild. This is unpopular at the moment. <laughs> this is unpopular. I am unsure at the risk of sitting on the fence. You know, I thought I was probably 60, 40, keep Simo at the moment. Um, well, now I'm probably 40, 60, which means I'm probably 50, 50. I flip between the two. I actually think to, to sum it up, I actually think, bear in mind, I'm recording this before the Sydney game. So I'd imagine we got annihilated. You're watching this after the result. I have no idea what happened. But I think the next block of games is seriously key as to uh, how we ass assess Simo. So I've got it here. We play Richmond at Optus Stadium, a home derby, Gold Coast away, and Essen at Optus. Now, we might not win any of those games for sure. But if we need to get close. We need to get close. We need to show serious signs of improvement for at least a couple of those games. If we don't, if we're meandering, uh, then I do think Simo might not be the right guy. So, But uh, fair enough, I, I like your faith. We've got a bunch on Collingwood. Bear in mind, these, I think, were all commented before um, they beat Brisbane, which I think is, is worth noting. Uh, ben Aker says, Collingwood will not be okay. They are washed. Um, tough. I've got the benefit of knowing that they've beaten Brisbane and you didn't. Um, that being said, we can still assess the opinion. I do probably think... Uh, I am probably doubtful that they're going to come back and win another premiership either this year or next. With the ageing profile of their list, I think there's going to be a shift. It doesn't mean they'll fall down the ladder, but in terms of genuine premiership contention... I don't think it'll happen this year. And if it doesn't happen this year, it's hard to make a case that it'll happen next year. We've got a few on Nick Dacos. Jungle Pubes. <laughs> I just read that out loud for the first time. Grim. Jungle Pubes says he might be overrated. And Ronnie Alder says he's actually a really good player, but in the media, they make it seem like the greatest of all time. Yeah, so this is an interesting example of the overhyped versus overrated conversation. Being from WA, I, I particularly notice it um, with certain Eagles players, you know. I've often made the case that Nick Nat Nui wasn't overrated. He was just simply overhyped. And what happens then is that it impacts your psychology around whether or not you like that player. I would agree he's been overhyped when you think about it. Like, I do think he's an outstanding player. I think he's a really good 
halfback rotating through the midfielder. I, I think, to be honest, I would keep Dacos as a running defender for most of his career and rotate through the midfield. I think he's I think he's more damaging in that role and he's one of the best in the game at that particular role. But in terms of how much his face gets plastered around, how much he gets talked about, you know, someone like a Tom Stewart is, is way better in my opinion. Still, he's still a better player. And yet, you, you will see Tom Stewart get talked up when Geelong are playing, but not so much around that. And that's probably the less hype component of this. But either way, he's a very good player, but he's, yeah, he's not, not the greatest of all time. If you on Richmond now, doggy dogs is Richmond will challenge for the eight for most of the season. Uh, Arosh also says targets to make the eight, as does AFL snaps. Now, I have talked up Richmond a lot, bearing in mind, again, I'm recording this after round three. They've just beaten Sydney, and I'm full of praise for the way they're playing. I think Adam Uze's proven that he can be a really good coach already. Obviously, not, not fully proven, but you know what I mean. He's made a good start, and uh, my estimation of him has certainly risen. I don't know about eight. I just think it's a list depth point of view. I mean, they're playing really well now, considering their injuries. So as I currently record it, Prestia, Hopper, Graham, Gibkiss, Lynch, and Bolter are injured. They're still playing well, but I'm skeptical about how long they can keep that up. I mean, I think I think if West Coast, they're not really great comparisons. West Coast is a worse team and their injuries were worse, but hear me out. When West Coast injuries took hold last year, for a couple of rounds, we didn't play horrific. It took, there was a delayed reaction for, for the impact of those injuries to hit because, you know, we, first of all, our heads dropped and we couldn't sustain that energy. And I don't think Richmond is gonna fall off like West Coast did by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just saying it'll be it harder over time if they keep missing key players to sustain what they're doing. They don't look anything like a bottom four team, but I don't think they'll make finals. We've got a few on Geelong here. Tiger Talk says Geelong and Freo's early run of form doesn't reflect their team strength. They won't play finals. Zelma Zam says Cats have been lucky to get these wins. I still think they are bottom six bound. He also says also umps should be able to issue red cards, so we'll park that for a moment. So the Cats have beaten Hawks, Crows, and the Saints. Freo have beaten the Lions, North, and the Crows. Geelong's opponents... By the time I record this, St Kilda is the only team that's won a game. They've won one. Frio's three opponents have been winless. On Geelong, I think they've played pretty good footy without being outstanding. I think they'll still be around the mark for finals. I don't see bottom six. Equally for Frio, I don't think bottom six. But I am waiting for Frio. So like by the time you watch this, Frio will have played Carlton. And I'm looking to see how close that game is. I, I, I don't expect them to beat Carlton. But if they get close, even if it's not necessarily a good game, like if it's a scrap, they restrict Carlton, they play decent defensive footy, and it's a decent game in terms of closeness, then, then Freo will have gone up more in my estimations than, say, their win over Adelaide. So I agree to the extent that it's still unproven, but I'm not willing to write either of these teams off. Geelong or Freo could certainly make finals from what I've seen so far. As for the red card thing, I, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. I feel like it's pretty rare that it actually happens where a player should be red carded. I think Gaff should have been red carded. I think maybe Webster should have been red carded. Barry Hall should have been red carded. The Peter Wright one for me, don't get me wrong, I understand the suspension, but I really don't think that would be a red card situation. That being said, in terms of the actual mechanism of reviewing footage in the breaks, like you said, I'm not terribly against it. I'm not terribly against it. But I, the one thing that would actually have a flow on effect on is, is if assume it's like soccer. In soccer, you have to play with 10 men. You can't just replace that player on the field. They'd have to play with 17 on the field. I do feel like that would have a massive flow on effect to the impact on player load management, stuff like that. So maybe that's a consideration. A couple more on Frio here. Chomix says Jackson, all Australia. And Graz says Amos top three in a Coleman. I think Jackson is comfortably in the current All Australian team right now. I think he's playing outstanding, so no argument there. Uh, Graz says Amos top three in the Coleman. I don't see this happening. He's a great player, but he's kicked seven goals in three games. There's 12 players ahead of him currently and about eight tied with him. Now, there's so much to play out, but I think there's too many contenders who are going to keep more goals this year. But he's a great player. We've got a few on Hawthorne, and this actually was interesting for me. So Just, just Cause AFL says the Hawks will finish lower than North, and Zoc Devoid says Hawks will go 0-5 to start the season. So you already know if they lost their fourth game, but they play the Pies and gather round, and I'm tipping the Pies. Then they've got the Suns away. So that's probably a game that's going to be tough for them. They could win it. Um, then round six, they got North at Marvel. Uh, this was their first win last year. North were 2-0 at that point. So that's winnable. Uh, but at the moment, North have definitely looked the better of the two teams. But I'm not convinced that Hawthorne are ruined. Let, let's go back to last year. I had a look. Prior to their big win over West Coast in round 10, they were 1-8. and eight. They were bottom of the ladder. Look at the margins of their losses. 59, 54, 69, 81, 82. So they started horrifically last year, and they were able to turn it around. And I think that North might struggle to run out this season. I've said that before. Not an opinion I strongly hold. But I still think Hawthorne might 
might finish higher. We'll see. The game they play against each other will be probably the key factor there. It also makes me feel a little bit better about West Coast. Like, look at Hawthorne's last start, uh, starts of last season. Two 80-point beltings, a 69, a 54, a 59. People are talking about West Coast as the worst team of all time. I bet they weren't saying that about Hawthorne. A couple more North points. Steph says McCurchin will be better than Reed. Callum Williams says North Melbourne will finish strong, winning four out of the last five games this season. To start on McCurchin, like, I love McCurchin. Um, so I don't want to just get my back up because I'm an Eagles fan. I don't think he's a better prospect than Reed. I think it's too early to say. I mean, like, fair enough if you have this opinion prior to round one. Fair enough. Um, but based on how this season's going, I thought it was always going to happen that McCurchin was going to have a better season than Reed, And that's documented. I tipped McCurchin for the Rising Star several times. This one will be assessed over time, but I think Reed definitely has more weapons. But McCurchin's an absolute star. If we'd have traded down and taken McCurchin at pick two, I would have walked away okay with it. As for North winning four of their last five, looking at their last five, they've got Hawthorne in Tassie. They've got the Bulldogs. They've got the West Coast in Tassie. They've got Richmond at Marvel. And they've got the Cats. I, I you know, it, Fair enough tipping them against Hawthorne and West Coast. The Bulldogs and Geelong will be tough. And then there's Richmond. So big call. I think a young list will find it hard to finish the season well. That's my argument. They're the youngest list in the comp. So I think they're going to have to bank their wins earlier than that. A couple of from Essendon from A Life of Tetris. Bombers have actually had a good start to the season after two rounds. So this comment was made um, after they'd lost to Sydney. So since this comment was made, they beat St Kilda. So fair play. VCS, on the other hand, says Essendon and Richmond finished bottom four. The Saints defended under 12th and wins are for the Rising Star. So that's a little bit more contentious. So generally speaking on the, on the Dons, I think they've been pretty okay. They're, they're two and one. Um, the St Kilda game was scrappy. It wasn't a great standard, but St Kilda do kind of play that way. They, their defensive zone and their pressure is good, but they can improve over time. I think their best 22 is solid. Um, I, I think I'm comfortable with where Essendon's at, hoping that they improve. Port away this week is a big litmus test. So again, I'm recording this before that game happens. Running out the season is another big test. As for Essendon and Richmond bottom four, it's tough. It's tough. To, for, for both of them to finish bottom four, you need one of Hawthorne, North Melbourne, or West Coast, I presume you don't mean West Coast, to jump out of the bottom four. So on current form, that seems to be North. So will North finish higher than Essendon and Richmond? I'm unconvinced. And St Kilda, I just don't agree, will finish under 12th. I think they'll finish between 6th, 7th, 8th. El Voilador says, I have one, but I'm not sure how to explain it. A number of AFL greats are actually only good because they were in a team that planned based around their strengths or a game plan based around their strengths. A heavily offensive midfielder, a high possession intercept defender or an 80, 90s power forward. Uh, yeah, I, I think that back in the day, um, you know, even in the early 2000s, it was easier for individuals to thrive um, you know, if you were a gun forward in particular. Obviously, goal-kicking tallies have gone down heaps because of defensive zones and stuff like that. And I would genuinely agree that, you know, you put... <laughs> You might even put Gary Ablett Sr. into the modern game, and he probably... Well, he certainly wouldn't have kicked a 1,000 goals. He'd probably still be elite, absolutely. But I don't necessarily think he'd be transcendent. I think uh, the way the game's played these days, it's hard for individuals to keep standing out. But back in the day, it was very much man on man. We've got some mixed opinions on Adelaide here. Lethal Saints says, Adelaide are on track. It just hasn't clicked yet. Play on footy says, the Crows will play finals. Uh, AFL Legend says Adelaide will finish bottom six. And then Dan says Matty Nix is an awful head coach and should have been sacked in 2020 when he took a team that finished 11th the year before to win a wooden spoon. Testing my memory a little bit on the 2020 season, it felt like Adelaide, after that grand final, obviously there was the community camp. Like It felt like things fell apart at that football club. And I don't remember thinking that their spoon was a massive shock. There's been a big list turnover. So I don't know if I agree simply by that, but obviously I'm not watching it as closely as you clearly. But in terms of Adelaide this year, um, I found some interesting stats. So they're 17th in the competition for scoring from stoppages and ranked 18th in scoring from turnovers. Those are pretty much the two main ways to score. A lot has been said of their vanilla midfield. So the talk about like Laird and Crouch playing the same team. Sure, they're winning the ball in the inside. As soon as the ball gets first possession outside the contest, that's where they tend to fall apart. And there's been a lot of talk about guys like Rankin, Rochelle, Saligo, and even Pedler spending more time in the guards. They're all quite young and small. Well, Rankin's the oldest, if I'm not mistaken there. And Saligo, Saligo's already doing a pretty good job, I reckon. Pedler's going to take some time. I don't know if Rochelle will ever be like a full-time midfielder. He might just be impact. So getting that mix will be really important. There's also an interesting stat here. I think this is from Lee Montagna. He says, if you go back to the start of last year, um, if they score 100 points in a game, they're 8-0. No. That's not groundbreaking. Generally, 100 points in a, in a game these days is going to be a winning score almost all the time. But if you keep them under 100, they're 3-15, and 15, which means basically that 
Adelaide concede a lot. We kind of already knew that. So they have to really put scores on the board themselves to win games. So when that dries up, at the moment, their midfield forward connection is looking awful. Um, Taylor Walker's obviously aging. Phil Thorpe's injured. I think long-term, they're all right. But like, in terms of four targets, Phil Thorpe's going to be a good player. Darcy Fogarty is a decent player. They're also getting Tyler Welsh. So it, they might have to be patient with that. But either way, I, I actually think the midfield is the first place they need to address. Couple isn't Sydney. More Srom says Swan's defense isn't very good. They'll almost fall out of the eight by the end of the year. And Ron Haas says Sydney or GWS will fall out of the top four or even top eight. So top four is not a massive contentious call. Like that that happens all the time. I remember thinking in 2021 when the Bulldogs fell out of the top four, uh, that that was crazy. Um, so it, it can be like, like a game of inches sometimes. And if you're slightly off, you could fall down a ladder. So top four, possibly top eight. I don't see either of these sides missing the top eight. They're too good, both of them. The Swan's defense on paper is a little bit lacking, no doubt. Um, so far, I mean, they conceded 82 against Richmond. They conceded 101 against Essendon. So the, the Essendon one was weird, but they scored 131 themselves. So we'll see over time. I'm, I'm still think Sydney top four for me personally. And a couple more to finish off the show. Naga says, according to Jesse, the Saints are no good, true or false. I don't know where you're getting that from. I have no idea. I've talked up the Saints heaps. I've talked up the Saints in this video. I still think sixth, seventh, eighth. I think this is based on me not tipping. So my tipping performance on them, I've only got one right, but to clarify, I got I tipped them to lose to Geelong, uh, which they did. I tipped them to lose to Collingwood. I thought Collingwood would win that. So I got that wrong. And, and then I tipped them to beat Essendon, um, and I got that wrong, which means I've tipped them to win one game out of three so far, and that's exactly what they've done. So I won't cop that. I feel like I've talked up St. Kilda heaps. Dean says, the Bulldogs list is good, but not great. It has a whole lot of high-level talent, but lacks role players. Yeah, I think there's something to that. I noticed they got it like a... A bunch of role players now, like Gallagher's new to the side. I think Riley West is pretty decent from what I've seen. Uh, Buku Kamas, I don't know if you consider him a role player. He looks pretty promising. Then there's Bramble. They also traded in Caulfield and Harms. And I noticed, obviously, Caulfield's injured, but Harms has only played one game. Is he injured? I haven't seen anything to suggest he's injured. But I agree, like, they've almost got too many gun primary mids or players that are capable of being primary mids and some gun key position players, particularly forward of center. But I do agree that it's these, you know, these unheralded um, role player types that generally will be the difference between teams winning flags and teams not winning flags. So maybe it will hold them back, but there's still a bit to play out. I don't think they've looked too bad this season. Anyway, guys, that is my take on your unpopular opinions. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you want me to do this again uh, in May. Should be able to do one in May, um, but for now, I'll say goodbye and I'll thank you for watching. Cheers.